Welcome to the CircuitPython Show. I'm your host, Paul Cutler. Today in Episode 3, I'll be talking with Professor John Gallagher of Boston College. As founding faculty for the Boston College Tech Chuck programs and the former co-lead of the school's graduate field studies in Europe and Asia, Professor Gallagher has had exceptional access studying technology growth and impact worldwide. Professor Gallagher and his students spend several weeks each year visiting with and attending masterclass sessions hosted by technology executives, entrepreneurs, and venture capitalists. This unique opportunity helps provide his teaching and writing with a broad, deep, and continually refreshed perspective on key industry trends and developments. Professor Gallagher also works closely with collegiate entrepreneurs and is co-advisor to the Boston College Venture Competition, an organization whose affiliated businesses have gone on to gain admittance to elite accelerator programmers, such as Y Combinator, Techstars, Mass Challenge, and more, to launch multiple products and raise millions in capital. Professor John Gallagher, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I wanted to talk to you because you're currently teaching two classes at Boston College with one featuring CircuitPython. What inspired you to add CircuitPython to your curriculum? Sure. Um, well, first, thanks so much for having me on. I mean, it's it's always such a, um, a wonderful thing if somebody takes an interest in your work. So it's um, my pleasure. It's really great. And and good luck with the podcast, too. I think that this is going to be a wonderful thing for our community. Thanks. Um, and uh, it's worth saying thanks to the community, too. I mean, you say, who inspired you for that? It's really, you know, the people who have put CircuitPython together, this wonderful open source effort, and really all the things that Lamour and, and PT have done at Adafruit have been um, just amazing. I love sharing their story with students. I love using their products with students. And um, and so, you know, that really prompted me to, to go ahead and... and start to experiment with this stuff. Um, I'm not an engineer, so I was computer science as an undergraduate. My PhD is in information systems, so half in tech and half in business. Um, and I've been teaching managerial classes for 20 years and worked closely with our student entrepreneurs. Um, one of the biggest issues that they had was they couldn't build their vision. So about six years ago, we did a um, zero to full stack app development class. We didn't I don't think anybody really had anything like that. So we could take somebody in that did nothing. We move really, really fast. Um, and by the end, they build something which is, um, you know, it's a real iOS app in Swift. And Oh, that's uh, awesome. Yeah, they're, they're doing their stuff in the cloud. It has multi-user login. They're saving images and data. It's, it's like Yelp. And so that was sort of the, the second bit of a stool. So we had the managerial piece and we had a programming piece. And a lot of our students were really interested in hardware and the fast, cheap hardware revolution, the maker revolution, they sort of go hand in hand. CircuitPython makes things so much easier than, you know, in the Andrino world. Um, you know, there are so many wonderful standards like Quick Stem QT. Right. And so, um, you know, you could really get students to do some fairly sophisticated engineering stuff that was, you know, responding to distance sensors and doing, you know, wild animations. And, and um, you know, I know you had Katni on, I guess. Uh, um, as, did she come on yet? Um, we're using her library, which is just wonderful with our students. And so, you know, a student with just a few lines of code and not even having to break out a breadboard can build amazing things. So, um, you know, I didn't so even been... think of it from that angle that you don't require a breadboard, right? Yeah. We're so used to thinking about microcontrollers in that way. But when you grab a Circuit Playground, Blue Fruit or Express, it's all right there. It really is. And, you know, it, it makes things easier for me as an instructor. And um, so it's it's tough to tell sort of looking at me, but I, um, I have really bad vision, like so bad that I can't drive. So... I'm working with a breadboard. I usually put these um, uh, magnifiers over my eyes so that I can see things. And, you know, I'm still constantly getting stuff in the wrong pins. And I think everybody does that, even if you have decent vision. I do and it all so, the time. Like, taking that out, that's that's yet another, that's, I think, sort of the engineering equivalent of, um, you know, having not enough parentheses or too many parentheses or getting your um, indentations wrong in Python. It's, it's the stuff that kind of gets in the way of learning. So, you know, these standards are just so wonderful to be able to get students up to speed really quickly. And the, um, the glow that you see on their faces when they accomplish things, they get stuff to happen that they, you know, didn't even think that they could be doing, you know, a, a few minutes ago is, is, is great. I know the first time I started playing with it, just getting a simple LED to turn on or blink, you're just like, yes, I did it. So oh, I can only it imagine what it's like for college students. It's super fun. And, you know, one of the things here at the university, so Boston College is a Jesuit university, um, which uh, there tend to be some students that part of the mission of the university is is people for others, men and women for others, people for others. And um, so there is a lot of civic mindedness in the student population. And I think that happens with undergraduates in general. I, I think we're probably a little bit more weighted for that. Um, even in the School of Management, there are a lot of students that want to use their powers for good. 
Um, and I think low cost hardware provides a way for them to think about that kind of stuff. So, you know, we do some interesting things in class where um, students partner with a um, an on campus um, uh, school that's actually so we have a, a campus school which is run um, through the School of Education are partnered with our School of Education, where kids from three years old to 21 years old that have pretty severe developmental and physical disabilities. Um, it's a school for them. And so our students uh, work on um, physical computing products for the campus school. And we just started this last semester, but um, you know, we bring in folks, they work with the client base there. And um, it's just so empowering, I think, for students to see, hey, I can take things from class, I can build you know, real projects, I can see them deployed, and I can see them impact somebody else's life. And that's so much of a difference from a conventional class where you might you know, be working with somebody else's data for data analysis to learn data analysis right. or, or, you know, writing a paper that just you and your professor will see. So um, it's a real pri privilege to, to, um, to, to be able to teach this way and, and um, share that experience with my students and, and with campus school. Accessibility is something that I'm really passionate about. Uh, are there any examples that come to mind of what your students have built that the, the students in the school are using? Sure. So, um, they actually have a, a coffee shop on campus, so they just have a few things on their menu. But as you can imagine, you know, somebody that's very, very restricted in, in, in a wheelchair and has really serious mobility issues. So, you know, maybe can only tap accessibility buttons on their on their chair and maybe they're nonverbal. Um, you know, running the coffee shop is, is a real challenge for them. Um, but uh, one of my students did a cash register so, you know, they could control via um uh, light touch switches on their wheelchair that just plug into a standard RCA jack, which is common in accessible technology. They could control the cash register drawer, you know, make it open and close. Um, and they could also trigger a thank you across the the back. So if you're nonverbal and, and most of the kids are, you know, they can thank genius. Folks, so that was really nice. Oh, it's it great. Um, another group said, you know, kids are kids. They want to play. And, you know, if you have certain physical challenges, you can't throw a ball back and forth, but they took, um, LED matrices and the kids can pass the animations back and forth with LED matrices and it's Bluetooth that communicates between the matrices. So, um, and you know, again, not a breadboard involved in this. It's just, um, it's wonderful. So really just, uh, it, I, I want all the people that are, are volunteering in the circuit Python community to hear about this stuff too, because, you know, I think they know that they do really great work and, and they should and, and be really proud of it. But, um, Man, there there just have to be tens of thousands of people out there that are um, really changing lives and impacting their own lives through their good work. So if um, we can get, you know, Scott and Dan and Katni and, and all of those other wonderful folks, Liz from Blitz City, I know, has contributed. And I know I'm going to forget some folks. I haven't met any of these people in person. So hopefully right. at some That's point. That's the beauty of open source. Um, but uh, for all of you, you know, you get big thumbs up and and thank you. And and I raise a, a beverage for to you guys. So. Going back to something you said a minute ago about conventional teaching, how are you teaching your undergrads hardware? I believe I, you shared a video with me that I'll put in the show notes, and I think you called it a flipped class. So yeah. how are they getting hands on? So um, this sort of came out of there was a lot of talk about flipped class and teaching innovation, and there's there's certainly a lot of talk about this kind of stuff. Um, I, I'd say it's 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 tough to sort of change um, your model if you've been brought up in a model and this is what teaching looks like, and these are the materials that you're provided with. But when I started to do the, um, or when I had planned to do the programming class, the zero to full stack class, I had recognized if we want to try to teach somebody app development and programming at the same time in a class that may have programmers, but that invites non-programmers in and about half the students haven't taken a collegiate coding class. We also get fourth year computer science students. Um, if we try to have them all in one space, that can be messy. And you know, sometimes students are going to ask questions or want to roll back what I just said. Um, and so there's this idea of the flipped classroom, which is you take your lessons and you have that outside of the class and homework time, usually delivered via video and students follow along and do something with the lesson. And then in class, you would do what normally would be in homework time, which are assignments that um, extend and really emphasize and make sure that students are taking away the things from the lessons that they should be taking away. So the real challenge for faculty is that means you've got to film everything. And um uh, I guess like a lot of content creators, like I'm not really happy unless it, the quality is, is decent. So I spend a lot of time. There's usually a couple of days ago in every single video. But, I know that um, feeling. I'm sure you do. And, you know, I keep thinking, well, I'm going to get better. And just it still takes just as long. Um, 
But what's I think really special for students in this kind of experience, and so you know my class uses just Circuit Python just to kind of give you a, a experience. There are no requirements for this class. Um, we start off with a Circuit Playground Bluefruit. Uh, we migrate to um, about a third of the way through the course through to the um, Arduino Nano RP2040 Connect. So that runs Circuit Python. It's one of their new boards that use the RP2040. And um, we finish up on a Raspberry Pi, so they all get um, three uh, A pluses. So it's you know it's it's it sips power, and but it's it's cheap, and um, it has an audio jack, which was important for sure. some of the things that we wanted to do. Um, and but they're using Circuit Python like straight across on all of that stuff. Um, and similarly, including with the, the Pi, yeah, they are. Yep. So I have them put. Um, uh, Blinka on there Perfect. and they do, you know, robotic stuff and they actually do MQTT by the end. So, you know, we have students that have never written a line of Python code that are doing MQTT stuff by the end and real internet of things. Um, uh, I've written an app for them to be able to trigger stuff over Wi-Fi on their Pi. So, you know, they can Fantastic. do really whatever they can code up. Um, but what's wonderful about this stuff is, first of all, I think a lot of students get discouraged in, in coding um, who have not had the experience of being able to code before. So you get the ringers that have had, you know, um, engineering in high school and have been coding since junior high or, or earlier. Um, and they can intimidate the other students. And it's so easy to, to see a few students that are, are succeeding in getting it all right away. And learning to code is like learning a foreign language. I mean, you have to kind of go through the pattern several times before it clicks. So what's nice about the flipped class is if it doesn't click the first time, you just rewind it. If it doesn't click, you can rewind it again. You're never in the class with, and you know, again, it's, it's so dangerous making gender um, generalizations, but most of those high-performing students are like the dudes that were attracted to something as, as undergrads. And um, so I think physical computing is something that, that um, is uh, an easier entryway. It's fewer women, fewer students that, that may have had um, not have had the privilege of having a classroom with, you know, high end computing that was involved, though they're tended, they're, they will be more likely to be less discouraged um, in, in a flipped class, I think, because, you know, you're, you're not there feeling like everybody else is getting it. Um, what else is really special about that is, you know, for if you've been sitting in a class and you had to go to the bathroom when, when a professor introduced something that you were going to use for the rest of the semester, I mean, you were hosed. So, you know, with this, you can continue to rewind. Um, but as a faculty member, too, you know, I, I enjoy having office hours. I think one of the toughest things in office hours was to have students that sh would show up and say, I'm totally lost. And in a flipped class, you never have that happen. A student will say, I was trying to do this and I'm not really sure why I did this or um you know, I've been trying to repeat it and I'm not sure why my code isn't working, but the code on the screen is working. So they submit stuff and, and they submit in GitHub in the in the um, Swift class. They submit through Canvas, our learning management system in the CircuitPython class. But, you know, they're coding in Moo. Um, and um, and yeah, so that's how it works. So in class, we um, we have challenges for the most part. I will introduce some new things in class from time to time or just say, yeah, well, hey, does everybody understand this? I'll bring in stuff too. So for example, here on my um, table, they were learning last week how to do LED animations with Katni stuff. And so I've got this little Fibonacci 64 from the Evil Genius Labs folks. Sure. And, um, you know, I mean, it's the same uh, library that you use on this. All you need to do is just change the pin number. So just showing them, hey, the possibility of what they've learned because of CircuitPython, you know, it works on other boards, their code can migrate, you've just got to change these few, you know, attributes or parameters. Um, it's kind of like the Java promise that we had where you write once, run everywhere. <laughs> yeah. and, and we really see that with CircuitPython. So those guys are delivering. But the classroom, and I'm so sorry to windbag on you. No, this is um, what I wanted you to have be on the show. Well, good. So, so the, but the classroom um, atmosphere, I try to make it fun. So we just had a class last night, which was similar to, I, I did like sort of a little summary video that I shared with you. So if it, if it's oh, this, the video you shared that I'll put in the show notes is, is fresh, brand new. Oh, good, good, good. As it's, it's, it's wonderful. So, so I actually did that last semester, but, but this week we did um, so the same exercises. And so you know, I'll say, okay, students, you know, you learn how to do animations, you learn how to work with different sensors. So um, they w worked with potentiometers. So I'll have them use a potentiometer to control a servo because they have one lesson on potentiometers, one lesson on servos. And I'll set up a little piece of paper and candy around the piece of paper. And they bring their potentiometer and servo and their circuit playground blue fruit up and turn the potentiometer and point to the candy that they want so they can leave with that. Or we have another thing where they build the goblet of glory. And so they learn how to, um, you know, play sounds. So they also use the accelerometer. So when they lift up their goblet of glory to, to toast, 
the CPB is in the base of it. It detects movement along certain axes, axes, and will play the Boston College fight song or the Harry Potter theme or the theme of the Thrones. So yeah, so, so yes, all this fun stuff. So, um, but they love it, and I tease my students, and and I mentioned this to my wife earlier this week. I, I said this before though to, to my colleagues, like I um. I really think that you should teach programming like a Peloton class. I mean, I think that, you know, you should be shouting out and celebrating student success and encouraging them. And um, it's a little tough to do that first if they've never done it before, because right. they kind of like freak out like, whoa, he's you know out here with us and stuff. And, you know, he expects us to, to woo hoot up. But um, after you break through that, and you give him some candy and, and things. Um, it's a really fun place to be. And coding class should be a fun place to be. And if, if folks flub you know you can see other people struggling around that or you know plugging things in the wrong way and we encourage students to um talk to one another during the the um, in-class exercises in the flip class so there is a much more collaborative environment um i find you know since the students are walking around and coming up to me i'm getting to know the students better you know i get to know their names faster and, oh and sure things. so it There's just a breaks down a lot of the barriers where you know um a 19, 20 year old, maybe kind of reluctant to come into a professor's office that has all of these books in them and stuff. So I have lots of geeky projects in my office too, that to let students play. So that's another thing to, that's a good thing for educators to do is build lots of fun stuff for students to, to try out. Hi, it's Paul. I'll get you back to the show in just a moment, but first I wanted to say thank you for listening. If you like the show, please hit the subscribe button, write a review or tell a friend. You hear that a lot, but it really does help. For other ways to help the show, visit circuitpythonshow.com slash support. Now, back to the show. So in addition to collaborating amongst each other, you recently challenged your students to also collaborate with the greater CircuitPython community. What did you have in mind there, and how has that been going, in your opinion? Yeah, so, um, uh, and I'll be really frank, um, you know, it, it, so I, I have a PhD, I was a coder in industry, I led software development teams, and after getting my PhD in information systems, um, you know, I've been teaching managerial courses for 20 years. So I had to relearn to program when I decided I was going to program. And I'd actually exper experimented with Python on hardware. The university gave me a grant to buy, you know, 100 circuit playgrounds and, and share them with my students so we could see before I built this class, how did students receive, you know, being able to do just a little bit of Python in that. It was a great thing. But I have had to learn myself. And there's plenty of stuff that I just, you know, takes a while to figure out or, you know, I'll read online and, the technical description in the documentation isn't clicking or, you know, a wonderful learn guide just tries to implement things in a different way than I'm trying to do it. And the Adafruit community has been wonderful for me. And I think one of the things that's, that's important is just, just, you know, feel comfortable letting your guard down. So um, I, I think the thing about having a PhD is, is um, all it takes is time and commitment. And sometimes you don't have that. So, I mean, there's so many people out there that are way smarter than I am. Um, but, um, I have no problem saying, Hey, I don't know how to do this really basic thing in Python. Can somebody help me out? Or, you know, I think I knew how to do it, but I don't know why this data structure is behaving differently than I expected it to. Um, and the Python community, they're, they're like this antidote of, um, at least I should say that the, in particularly the Adafruit communities, um, and the maker community, I think you can say in general, it's the antidote to sort of toxic Twitter culture and right. tech culture. Um, you know, they're so kind and they celebrate each other's work and they're funny. Um, and so the discord community, I can't believe that there are these, you know, brilliant geeks that lurk and are willing to just like throw down knowledge within minutes of you asking a question. And so I encourage my students, um, many of the students are getting it. And really what you have to do as a faculty member, I think sometimes is, is to, you know, continue to remind students two and two or three times. And then what will happen is a student will do it. And then they'll tell everybody, Hey, I use this thing and, and Gallagher isn't fleecing us, you know, it's, it's, it's right. there's real value here. So we need a little Adafruit validation. Form, yes. Oh, it's great. So I've been trying to, to get them to do, so I've, I've encouraged them to sign up for the podcast. Thank but you. Also for my students, they're, um, they're working on original projects. So the class is called physical computing, art, robotics, and tech for good. So there's sort of a mix of different projects they're doing, uh, three different projects during the course of the semester. And so like the Python and hardware um, newsletter that Ann puts together every week, that's really um, cool because it sort of is a one-stop scroll through, take a look at inspiring stuff that the community is doing. Um, I encourage them to follow, you know, a bunch of people on Twitter that I've thought have been really great. You know, Deborah Ansel with Geek Mom Projects has been yep. doing some wild stuff. I think everybody that I mentioned earlier. Um, 
And uh, I, I want them to, to see that stuff because they'll say, oh, I wonder, you know, if I can adapt that for myself or, you know, take a look at a learn guide or something. Um, so, you know, it, it's a new way for students to think about this. And I think that they've had, you know, the history professor that has said, you should read these five books and they don't have time for that. But um, proving to students that, hey, this really is worth your time and it'll, it'll help you do more and it'll inspire you more. Um, I think uh, the community really deserves big ups and, and, and props for, um, for all of their kindness in helping newbies um, get in there and you know, just definitely make sure that, 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 that you're aware Absolutely. that students may have zero knowledge when they're starting. Um, but it's, it's been wonderful. And, you know, again, this is, I think a really great thing about the Adafruit company is that, you know, they have each week their show where they celebrate cool stuff that they do and they put together the newsletter and there's no marketing in there other than that it comes from Adafruit. So, um, they have, uh, really led with culture in the community they're trying to create. And, and I think that they've done it. Um, it's really fun as a business professor to point to what Lamore has done and said, here's a woman engineer who founded her company, who's manufacturing in New York city companies clearly built with values and passion and um you know you don't necessarily the model isn't always zuckerberg you know right and, and if you if you build a billion dollar company that's awesome but um uh you know i i think lady has really inspired a lot of folks and and um she deserves more credit than i think she's receiving in terms of being a real role model for uh, another way to build a business that, that sometimes isn't seen. I mean, she hasn't accepted any venture capital, um, right. you know, it really is, uh, very different from many of the firms that, that I, we, we otherwise talk about in class and celebrate in class. So. so in addition to your class, you've shared almost all of these videos online. I think the Swift video on building a full stack app is over 125 videos. You've got maker snacks, little bite-sized circuit Python. Tell me a little bit about your YouTube channel and how that came to be. Sure. Um, you know, I, I figured if I was going to do a flip class, you know, why should I put it behind the firewall? Um, you know, so initially I thought, oh, what if people find the the stuff? And, and what I'd realized was um, sharing stuff, it, it's, it's useful for a bunch of reasons. One is um, sometimes it's just hard to stay motivated, um, you know, even in a faculty member and, and being a faculty member. I mean, it's just such a wonderful job because you're constantly getting feedback in terms of your performance. And if, if students like what you do, it's it's great. You know, you kind of see it in their eyes and you hear from them. Being a faculty member in the age of social media, I'm really active online. But um, one of the reasons that I do that, I tell my students. I look forward to exploiting you, but in the most positive of ways. Um, so, you know, one of the things I did on, on LinkedIn yesterday was I had a student that, that was applying for a particular consulting firm and said, hey, do you have any former students that I could chat with before I interview? And so, you know, I was able to throw that out. So this generation of faculty members that I'm part of, we have these resources where we can help students if we're motivated to help students, if that's what, what drove you to be a faculty in the first place. And it has for me, um, and we can really lean into that. But, you know, what's great is, you know, it's sometimes it's, you get down and I mean, COVID has just been terrible for everybody, I think. And, you know, I have kids that are going through their stuff and, and it's, right. it's just such a challenge. And so when you hear from some truck driver in Australia that says, hey, mate, thanks for your stuff, um, you know, that that helps me want to um, get back in there and to try to create some some cool stuff. So, you know, my motivation as an educator was really to, to, to reach other people and, and to, you know, help them learn and YouTube helps them do all of that. So, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, I started first with the YouTube stuff and then I, I wrapped a, um, cheap book in the app store. That's less than 10 bucks that students can get that just got reference material. Hopefully I'll do something like that with circuit Python at some point, but, um, uh, but yeah, for the most part, it's just the motivation of being able to reach more people. I oh, mean, it would awesome. be nice to see it become really big, but um, I don't know, you know, if what I do is is really, you know, gets that that you know kind of stuff. But um, you know, it's nice. I'll probably continue to do it into retirement, even you know, um, if 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 that ever happens, <laughs> who knows? You know, they let faculty teach till they're really old, as long as they're they're able to deliver the goods. So, well, I'll we'll make stay. sure to include those links in the show notes as well because those videos are really cool. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm really glad to hear that. It's, 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 it's nice to hear, um, you know, well, everyone fortunate... learns a little differently, right? Some people might want to read a learn guide on adafruit.com. Someone might mm -hmm. want to, you know, watch the video. Someone might need a friend to show them how to do it. So it gives them another avenue to learn. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's a, thank, thank you very much. It's very kind of you to say. So you mentioned one of your students is applying for a job. Um, what are some of the cool things your former students have gone on to do? 
so, you know, I'm really lucky um, uh, to have had the flexibility that I've had in, in my career. So, um, so I'm a tenured professor at Boston College. So you, what typically happens is, you know, you're hired as a faculty, you have a research commitment, you've got to meet a teaching bar too. And then when you're promoted from assistant professor to associate professor, you, you're sort of a junior partner and you have a job for life. Um, really, the difference between an associate and, and a full professor is, for the most part, just high-end research. Um, I'm fortunate to, to be in a department where there are a lot of really great high-end researchers. Um, and I'm also self-aware enough to recognize that, that that's not motivating for me. And I, I'm, even though I, I, I met the bar and, and it was great to, to get tenured, um, it is much more of a struggle for me than um, sort of, you know, writing um, wider market stuff. So, uh, you know, students liked some of the smaller things that I was writing. So I wrote a, um, a managerial textbook and, and it's being used in a lot of programs and stuff, which is great. You know, so I found a low cost publisher that sort of strikes the balance between, you know, I don't feel like it's the evil $200 textbook, but um, you know, when, when you create content like that, it's, um, it's a lot of work. So, so the fact that there's, there's at least some kind of, 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 of benefit for that um, uh, is, is, is great. It's like Adafruit wouldn't you know, give all our stuff away for free kind of thing, but, um, right. but yeah, it's, it's nice. It's, it's, it's expensive. We reach a lot of students, which is great. Um, and, um, geez, I lost my train of thought. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, and that's um, why we have editing too. And let me just make a note of that. <laughs> um, no, I was asking you, what have your, are there a couple of oh, examples what of what done. your former students have gone yeah. on to do anything? So, so, I don't know why I was talking about that stuff. Um, yeah. Oh, so, so anyway, so at BC, so, so it was a long way of saying at the university after getting tenure, um, I tried to look at some interesting teaching experiences that we could do because, you know, students really, while we gave them a lot of value in class, they really enjoyed connecting with people in industry. And it's especially important in business school. Um, we're almost unfair to students in, in suggesting to them that they've got to choose a major for their career path when they're 19 and 20 years old. And I agree. Like, you're going to be an accountant for the rest of your life or, or whatever. So um, we have this unfair advantage being in Boston and that it's, you know, it's a, a wonderful city where there are lots of different businesses and especially for me being in tech. So I would take students on the subway, you know, we had the, the, um, it, it's a trolley and it becomes a subway that's right on campus and, um, at the bottom of campus. And I'll take them into town every weekend or every Friday, I should say. And we would visit with, you know, Google's office, Microsoft's office. Microsoft has an office called Nerd New England R&D in Cambridge. Nice. They're, they're down by MIT. Um, you know, they met with Rodney Brooks, who's one of the great robotics pioneers when he was running a company called Rethink, Rethink, Rethink Robotics. Um, and the list just goes on. So one of them that, that they meet with in this class is a guy named Brady Knight. These are, are um, you know, young people out of MIT. They founded a few years ago. They have a robot restaurant in Boston called Spice. S P Y C E and sweet green actually bought them at the start of last semester, but it's yeah. Robots sort of prepare your food and they started out with Arduinos in their, um, the basement of where they were living, the, all of their hardware runs on Python. So for my students Amazing. to see somebody just a few years older than them, that's, you know, built this wild business with Python on hardware, they're using servos, they're using DC motors. So they, they can kind of see a path for them if, if that's of interest to them. So we can do like all this unfair stuff. Um, a few years ago, some of our alums in California had said, you know, hey, do you want to do anything for our students out here? And at the time I was running our East Asian field study program. So I'd, I'd worked abroad myself and, and they'd asked me to, to, to do this program. And the model was, you know, students would be in the class and then for half the semester, we would just like compress that within three weeks and we would go abroad. So we did the same thing with this program that we call Tech Trek at Boston College. Students study how companies go from startup to blue chip. And then in the Valley, we would visit with 20 firms and they were mostly alumni connected and it's so hard to get exec time, but there's such a sort of attachment to the alma mater. Um, so part of the access that we had, for example, was we have a, a, an institute on campus that was just started a year ago called the Schiller Institute. So Phil Schiller is the marketing head of, of Apple and, or he was up until last year. Um, and uh, Phil was always on stage with Steve Jobs. He's always on stage with Tim Cook. Most of the time he was the guy that held up the new iPhone when they were introduced. Right. Uh, say for the year when, when Steve introduced it and my students were actually there at the launch of the iPhone. So the last six Apple introductions, Phil had invited us out um, as part of our tech. It, we ran our tech track experience then before the semester started. One of my students was sitting next to Larry Page from Google. Um, so, you know, we'll do 20 visits like that where we'll go to Sequoia Capital and we'll go to startups that in many cases, some of my former students have started and Twitch and, you know, Facebook and Twitter and Zynga and 
So this started more of a pipeline for our students to work on the West Coast. Um, it started more of an interest in student entrepreneurship. And one of my first students built a company, sold it to Chase for, for $400 million. It was just crazy. A company called WePay. Um, and he started hosting our students and hiring our former students. Oh, nice. We had three other unicorn companies. So Uber bought a company called Drizzly um, a, a, a little over a year ago, I think. That was started at Boston College. I sort of teased, teased my students. Of course, it was students at the university who who created the business where you press a button and beer shows up. But um, yeah, Uber bought them for it was a billion dollars. It was just crazy. And what's fun for me is, you know, when my students come to office hours, say, so, you know, you're sitting in the exact chair where the three Drizzly guys, the three founders, had had sat. Right. So, um, you know, the people that they, they go ahead and start these businesses, they're they're way smarter than me. I mean, I, I'm just fortunate to sort of be in this role where I can provide them with rocket fuel. I can provide them with connections. I can create experiences where, um, you know, alumni or other executives really like speaking with young people and they'll drop knowledge. Um, so it's great. And we, so we've done programs in, in um, Silicon Valley, in New York city. Um, I ran an experience called tech Trek Ghana with uh, my colleague, Betty Banyani at, at, at Boston college for three years where we would study tech firms in, in West Africa. And that is really inspiring because when you think about what low cost tech can do, in terms of mobile money, in terms of what it's doing for, to empower farmers with farmer information. Lots of people don't know that Google has an AI research lab in Accra in Sub-Saharan Africa. So um, all that's super fun. We ran a boot camp in um, Dublin, Ireland. So BC's got a, a facility in Dublin. So we pack my class into three or four weeks over the summer. So if there are any faculty that, that are at cool international locations and want summer programs, let me know. Maybe I'll bring my students over and we'll do something jointly for app dev or, or for, um, for hardware, that would be a lot of fun for me. So well, there you uh, go. Well, you're doing great work, traveling. both with your students and then sharing that all online with everyone else. And, you know, we can't thank you enough. Well, the, the reason we can do that is, is because of everybody that contributes in the Python community and, and, you know, the people that are running really great companies and everybody that's been so supportive. Um, and, you know, thank you for the, um, providing a platform where we can learn more about each other's work and, and, um, and get more inspired. And, and, uh, you know, this is a really cool idea. So, so kudos to you and congratulations to you. Thanks. Um, so I've been asking all the questions in addition to circuit Python, I'm a huge vinyl record collector. <laughs> so I like to call this turn the tables. So mm -hmm. what's your one question that you have for me today? Mm. So who, who are your go-to bands? Oh boy. Um, you know, I used to joke that my collection was split into thirds. I had a third of the classic rock, easy to find vinyl, right? Boston, mm -hmm. Journey, Queen. Mm -hmm. Queen's a top five band for me. Mm -hmm. And then That's a third great. of it was 80s pop, which is very hard to find used on vinyl. Um, just not as much was made. Um, and then the last third, what I would say is modern indie music from like 2010 on. Oh, that's great. Um, Spoon is probably a top five band for me. So Spoon, <laughs> Queen, Pearl Jam, just off the top of my head. It changes on a daily basis, to be honest with you. But that's great awesome. question. Oh, wonderful. Yep. So it's, it's funny. I I was um I'm 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 vintage enough myself that the eighties were where I was in high school and in college. So so that's kind of my musical knowledge. And it sort of stops at 1990. So it's, it's, funny. It's, it's like, you know, just my, my life changed and I wasn't listening to radio as much anymore. So I feel like I don't know at all, you know, I'll watch who the musical guest is, et cetera. And, 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 There's been but, studies yeah. done that most people's musical taste stops in the early 20s. Mm. And it, it really doesn't evolve much from there, which I, I found interesting. Well, I salute your outstanding taste in, in, in music. That's, that's well, really wonderful. Thank you. So the question I ask at the end of every show, you're going to start a prototype or a new project with a microcontroller. Which board are you going to reach for first? Oh, uh, probably a feather board. Um, and uh, I like projects that have Wi-Fi. So, you know, if there's a feather board that has Wi-Fi um, and if it's remote, something that's got um, a battery capability um, built into it. Um, although I've got to tell you the, um, the new ESP, um, cutie pies are awesome. So they don't have the, the battery add on, but I guess, you know, there are ways that you can do that. You can buy third party stuff and Adafruit's fooling around with some add ons too. And I was um, just looking today, there's a cutie pie. I want to say RP 2040 with a Stemma connector, a Stemma yeah, key connector so, so as well. So you, it, that's actually what I'm using on, on, on this guy here. I, I, I attach it. So, so that cutie pie with stem is, is awesome. And then there's one that's the same profile. It has Wi-Fi on it. Okay. What, like 10 bucks more or less. Um, so that's crazy. Um, so one of the things that, that I want to do with that actually is um, 
uh, but I'll have to um, add some kind of battery um, capability with it, is it has a low power mode. And I've done not done, not done anything with low power mode, but um, I'm notorious for killing plants. So we see that there's a plant that's here, <laughs> but especially the ones in my office, like I'll go away for a week and then all of a sudden, ah, oh, they're dead. So I want to build something that I can check in every now and then and that will relentlessly tweet me or, or send me text messages if it gets thirsty so I don't forget um, and put a... Um, uh, you know, Adafruit did a wonderful thing a couple of years ago with the uh, Buckaroo Bonsai, where they had their um, this little sensor that was built into it. So you can do really cool Internet of Things projects, which are super, super easy. And that's one of probably I think every maker's got like 20 different things that they're working. I mean, my lab is just such a mess. If you were to look around, you would see all kinds of weird crap on the floor. Well, if you watch this on YouTube, my projects. my desk <laughs> behind me is no different with my workbench with, you know, half a dozen projects. So. But well, um, thank you for being on the show today. I really appreciate sure, the time. And sure. it was great learning about the work that you're doing. You know, I, I'll, I'll say to, to not only to you, Paul, but really to anybody in, in the community, if, if you're in Boston, um, you know, shoot me a note. And, and if I've got time, I would love to, you know, grab a beverage of choice with with whomever that's out there. It's interesting. So I had not known that Dan H, who's on the CircuitPython team, Liz Clark are, are both in the Boston area. Um, so we have yet to get together because of COVID. Liz had been so kind and, and reached out and said, hey, can I do anything with for your students? Um, so... Uh, we have this wonderful maker space that just moved out of Somerville and it's in Cambridge called Artisan Asylum here in Boston. It's massive. Um, but there's no reason why we can't have a better meetup uh, here in town. I'm going to try to go to, um, so I'm supposed to go to Italy um, in, in between semesters um, just for vacation and meeting a friend over there. I'm going to try to go to PyCon in Italy. So if anybody's going to, to Florence, um, let me know. I would love to say hi to folks. I have a lot to learn about Python. Again, it's, it's sort of like I look up half of the stuff that I'm using. Um, but um, yeah, it's uh, I want to make friends. Well, <laughs> so there you go, out. folks. You're going to be at PyCon in Italy out. or so, in Boston. Reach out to Professor Gallagher. Thanks very much. All right. Great thank chatting. you. All right. Thank you for listening to the CircuitPython Show, an independent podcast with the people in and around CircuitPython. For show notes, transcripts, and to support the show, visit circuitpythonshow.com or follow the show on Twitter at CircuitPyShow, that's Circuit P-Y Show. I'm your host, Paul Cutler, and I'll be back next episode. Don't forget to hit subscribe and stay safe.